Good evening, my friends, and welcome to another episode of Terror Radio Podcast. If this is your first time joining me, then welcome. This is the podcast dedicated and bringing you the best of horror and thriller old-time radio broadcasts, as well as original stories. I am your host, Keith, a.k.a. The Radio Show Nerd, and tonight's episode is entitled, Facing the Consequences. And once you hear both stories, you'll understand why. (laughs) So, without further ado, this is Terror Radio. The two radio series highlighted tonight are The Sealed Book and The Clock. We will start off with the radio play The Man with the Stolen Face, which was first broadcasted on the sealed book on September 16th, 1945. After that is the story of John Littlefield, which was first broadcasted on the clock on April 24th, 1946. Now, for those who are my day ones, if you will, They know that I have a love-hate relationship with (laughs) the sealed book. The musical interlude, if you will, go on forever. And it makes my head itch. I mean, it's almost like a mini concert. And it drives me crazy. But the acting, as well as the writing, as well as the plot, are absolutely phenomenal. So, wow, that was therapeutic (laughs) so you know the drill sit back turn down the lights and listen to the man with the stolen face followed by the story of John Littlefield Tale, 
The Man with the Stolen Face, as it is written in the pages of the sealed book. Our story begins in the large, richly furnished office of John Harrington, famous financier. It is late afternoon, and Harrington is speaking to Matthew Briggs, his very confidential secretary. Well, Matt, this is it. I swore I was going to retire when I had $20 million, and now I have it. I've worked hard, and now I'm going to play hard. And do your plans include me still? No, of course they do, Matt. I couldn't get along without you. I see. Yes, I suppose you still need someone to do your dirty work for you. Why, Matt, what a thing to say. Now, where would you be if you hadn't hooked up with me? Executed and buried these 14 years, that's where. I know, you don't need to remind me. Because after all, you did kill that man, Matt. Killed him in cold blood. No, you and I belong together. You could send me to jail, but I still have carefully locked in my lawyer's safe all the evidence necessary to send you to the gallows. Yes, I know. Now, uh, why don't you run along to the apartment? I think I'll sit and smoke one last cigar here in my office. All right. I'll see you later. (laughs) Poor Matt, how he hates me. There isn't a thing he dares do about it. Ah, well, I suppose a lot of people hate me. I'm not going to let that worry me any. Now is the time for me to enjoy myself. And I'm going to. Fun. That's my program from now on. Too bad that program will have to be canceled, Harrington. Who are you? I'm Jeremiah Cole, Harrington. You don't recognize the name, I see. Why should I? I never heard of you before in my life. I dare say not. But you've heard of my father, Nathan Cole. He gave you your first job 20 years ago. Well, what of it? I don't suppose you've forgotten that you got your start by cheating him out of his business. I did nothing illegal. You ruined my father after he'd befriended you and he died of a broken heart. I've spent 20 years trapping you, and now I'm ready to pull the noose tight. You're crazy. There isn't a man alive who has anything on me. I have. San Quentin. San Quentin? What are you talking about? When you were 19, a year before you came to the city and Dad gave you a job... You escaped from San Quentin, and you killed a guard doing it. Nonsense. You're you're crazy. Believe me, I can prove it. I've spent almost 20 years getting ready for just this moment. What do you want? I want $20 million. You can't be serious. Why, that's every cent I have in the world. You ruined my father, and I intend to ruin you. Turn over to me your entire fortune. I'll consider that punishment enough. No, no, I won't do it. I have two detectives waiting now in the outer office. Do you want me to call them in? No. No, wait. All right. I'll do it. I'll give you everything. Uh, I thought that would be your decision. Very well. Just sign this paper. And then you... Uh, What are you doing? Take your hands off my throat. You fool. You think I'm the man to give up that easy? I'll show you. Yes, I have twenty million dollars, and nobody's going to take them away from me. Nobody. <laughs> threaten me, would you? That's what happens to men who threaten John Harrington. Now I've got to get your body out of sight. Yes, of course, the vault. I haven't locked it yet. Plenty of room in it for a dead blackmailer. So, in you go. There you are. Now to close the door. And set the time clock. And nobody will be able to find you before Monday. As for your detectives outside, there's a back door to this office by which I can leave... You didn't know that, did you, Mr. Cole? There's a lot of things you didn't know. And one of them is that you shouldn't try to get the better of John Harrington. So John Harrington slipped away by means of the back door. And once safely outside, telephone Briggs giving Briggs instructions to meet him at his mountain lodge that night with all the money and securities he could put his hands on. 
Harrington then made his way by lonely back roads to his isolated lodge in the hills, at which Briggs presently arrived to learn his employer's unfortunate plight. But, John, what can you do? If you kill this man, Cole, I don't see how you... You're here to help me, not to hang creep. All right, just tell me what you want me to do. Then listen, we're safe here for quite a while. Nobody knows about this hideaway but you and me. We have plenty of food and we can stay here indefinitely. Yes, but the minute you leave here, someone will recognize you. That rugged face of yours has been in the papers and newsreels so often everybody knows it. I'm aware of that. So, I've got to have a new face. A new face? Why not? I know just the man to do it. Ludwig Muller. Muller. You mean the plastic surgery expert who was mixed up with that gang out in Chicago? That's the one. He was given five years for altering the features of members of the gang. Well, he must be out now. That was six years ago. Yes. Yes, I don't doubt he could do it, but... I have it all planned out. Now, first you've got to bring Muller here with all the necessary equipment. Then you have to find someone my age and my height who's willing to become John Harrington. Become you? That's insane. Why, even for all your money, who would trade places with you and go to the electric chair? Don't be stupid, Matt. I tell you, I have that worked out, too. Now, listen. You've got to find someone my age and general build who has no wife or family, who's not wanted by the police, and has never been involved with the law in any way, who's lived an inconspicuous life and has never attracted much attention. I'll take his place and live his life. He'll take mine and become a millionaire. But, John... Don't argue! You find such a man and bring him here. And I'll guarantee to persuade him to make the exchange. When I make a plan, it doesn't go wrong. Now to continue the story, as it is written in the sealed book. A week passed, then a second, and a third. Then late one evening, Briggs returned. In the car with him were two men, one large and heavy set, like John Harrington, the other slender, pale, and nervous. Briggs ushered them to separate rooms. Then he reported to his master. Well, man. Who have you got to take my place? His name is Quincy. William Quincy. I have his whole life history written down for you. Here. Ah, let's see. Hmm. William Quincy, 39, born in Detroit, parents dead, unmarried, no police record, college education, traveling salesman, down on his luck at the moment. Hmm. He seems to fit the bill. Does anybody know you brought him here? Not a soul. Good. Bring him in. I'll put the proposition to him. All right. Come in, Quincy. John, this is William Quincy. Hello, Quincy. Sit down. Holy smoke, you're John Harrington. That's right. Now sit down, have a cigar, and we'll get down to cases. Quincy, what would you do for a million dollars? 
A million dollars? I'm ready to pay that much money for someone who'll spend ten years, maybe less, in jail in my place. What kind of a trick are you trying to pull? Briggs told me you're wanted for two murders. I'm not trying to pull any trick. I'm innocent of the California murder, and the worst I could get for killing that fellow in my office is manslaughter. He was a blackmailer, and I lost my temper. Well, is it a deal? For a million dollars? Yes. Yes, it's a deal. Good. I'm afraid that you'll have to sell me your face as well as your time, Quincy. Sell you my face? <laughs> oh, that's a hot one. <laughs> What's so funny about it? Uh, excuse me, Mr. Harrington. I've always heard that a man's face was his fortune, but I never knew mine had any market value before. Well, it has. One million dollars. Okay. You've bought it. Of course, you have to take my face in exchange. Oh, sure. Huh. Sure, I understand. Good. There are a lot of things to be settled yet, but we have time for that. Uh, Matt, will you bring in Ludwig Muller? Of course, John. There's just one thing I want to know, Mr. Harrington. Huh? When I'm you, how am I going to clear myself of that California rap which you're innocent of? Very simply. You'll take my face, but your fingerprints won't jibe with the prints on file at San Quentin. That'll be obvious proof you're not the man. Very clever, Mr. Harrington. I think of every detail, Quincy, as you'll see. Oh, uh, come in, Dr. Muller. Dr. Muller, this is Mr. Harrington. Please, not Dr. Muller. I have no license. I am plain Mr. Muller. Just as you like, Mr. Muller. But sit down, please. Thank you. Now, may I ask why I was brought here? Just to help me and Mr. Quincy here exchange faces. Exchange faces? Why should you wish to do such a thing? For personal reasons. We plan to exchange identities. You could make my face look like Quincy's and his like mine, couldn't you? Yes. Yes, of course I could, but... Then you're going to do it. And I'm going to pay you a million dollars. A million dollars? No, you cannot mean it. I do mean it. With that much money, you can become a man of science again. You can build laboratories, experiment, become famous... All just for a simple job of plastic surgery. Not simply, no, but... Yes, Mr. Harrington. I will do it. Muller began work upon the two men. Day after day he worked. Patiently, with skilled fingers changing their features, making the face of one into the face of the other. It was a long and difficult job, but as the time for the removal of the final bandages came closer, John Harrington was in excellent spirits. Well, Quincy, do you feel ready to take over the role of John Harrington, millionaire? Any time. I've practiced your walk, your signature... I even know what you like to eat. <laughs> what are you going to do after you become William Quincy, Esquire? I uh, don't suppose you'll be going back to my old hometown, Detroit, will you? No, I hadn't planned to. <laughs> well, take a tip from me. Don't. What do you mean? Why not? Well, there are people there who don't like me. I thought Briggs said you had a perfectly clear record. No, I have, but... I quarreled with one or two people. Huh? Nothing legal, but, uh... <laughs> well, you wouldn't know who my friends were and who were my enemies, so... On the whole, it'd be simpler just to give Detroit a wide berth. You're talking very strangely, Quincy. What's behind it? <laughs> Not a thing. <laughs> I'm just worked up, I guess. Because <laughs> tomorrow we're going to see what we look like as each other. <laughs> The next day, Ludwig Muller removed the bandages from their faces and from Harrington's hands. And when he held mirrors for them to see themselves... Good heavens! You do not recognize yourself, huh, Mr. Harrington? <laughs> I should say not. Why, I'm almost tempted to say hello, Quincy, when I look in the mirror. It is my finest job. Well, I'll say it is. Personally, I like the change. I congratulate you, Muller. 
We must drink a toast to your success. Thank you. Ah, Thank that's you. a good idea. <laughs> we'll drink to Harrington, safe in jail. And Quincy, adrift in the wide, dangerous world. <laughs> what the deuce oh, are Oh, hello, Matt. Uh, how, how do you like my new face? Why, it's a perfect job. We were just going to drink to it. Uh, bring some glasses and a decanter, will you? In fact, bring the special decanter of Napoleon brandy. Certainly. I'll get it. Uh, Napoleon brandy, eh? Huh. Sounds good. Well, we'll drink to our futures. I may be going to jail for a while, but when I get out, I'm going to live high, wide, and handsome. <laughs> and how about you, Mr. Harrington Quincy? <laughs> Where are you headed for with my face? Oh, I'll see what New York is like, then try Buenos Aires and Rio de Janeiro. Here's the decanter, John. Huh. Shall I pour the drinks? Uh, yes, Matt, and one for yourself. No, thanks. I never drink. You know that. But uh, here you are, Quincy. Thank you. Dr. Miller. Thank you, thank you. And John. Thanks. Gentlemen, I propose a toast. To our collective futures. I'll drink to that. Come on, Doc. Bottoms up. Ah. Ah, that's smooth stuff. Now, oh, very good indeed, Mr. Harrington. I'm glad you liked it. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have some business to talk over with Matt. But keep the decanter and help yourself. Today is a day to cut loose. And I'm going to cut. Pour us both another, Doc. Sure. Come along into my office, Matt. Yes, John. Now sit down and let's see where we are. I've taken care of uh, everything I can think of. All transfers of money and stocks have been finished except for, well, a couple of million. I'm afraid we'll have to let those last few millions go. Too much danger trying to transfer them. But you've done well, Matt. Thank you, John. I... What was that? Sounded like somebody falling. Here it is again. I rather imagine it was Quincy and Muller, Quincy. Matt. The poison I put in that brandy yesterday works fast. Poison? Of course. I only pretended to drink mine. You mean you... you, you... Exactly. I couldn't let them live. They knew too much. Have you no human feelings, whatever? Not where my own skin is concerned. I propose to start my new life as William Quincy with a clean slit and no witnesses left behind me. Oh. Does that... Uh, include me too, John? I'm afraid it does, Matt. No, don't move. I have my gun here in my pocket. See? Yes. I see now. I've been a fool, haven't I? I'm afraid so. You should have acted first, Matt, and killed me. Yes, I should have. But I never had the courage. The race is to the strong, never to the weak. Maybe you're right, John. Maybe, but uh, the weak sometimes win, too. This is a joke on me and on Quincy, but it's a joke on you too, John, because... <laughs> because... Goodbye, Matt. <laughs> yeah, that's that. When the police find you, Matt, together with my body, <laughs> the story of John Harrington will be over for good and all. But the story of William Quincy, footloose and fancy free, is just beginning. <laughs> Thank you.
And now to continue the story as it is written in the sealed book. A day later, John Harrington slipped away from the mountain hideout, leaving death in sole possession. He had no qualms and no fears. His new face was that of another man, and he became the other man. As William Quincy, he reached New York and went to the hotel where Matt Briggs had made a reservation for him by mail. Uh, yes, sir. Can I help you? My name's Quincy, William Quincy. You're holding a suite for me. Oh, yes, sir. 17E. Uh, if you'll just register. Certainly. And here's a letter we've been holding for you, Mr. Quincy. A letter? Thank you. Well, it's in Matt's handwriting. And there were two gentlemen asking for you yesterday. Two gentlemen? Uh, yes, sir. What did you tell them? Uh, that you hadn't checked in yet, sir. If they ask for me again, tell them I've canceled my reservations. I'm here for a vacation, and I don't want to be disturbed by anyone. A few minutes later, John Harrington was alone in a luxurious suite Briggs had reserved for him. He stared out at New York with a scowl on his brow, fingering the letter the room clerk had given him. Who the deuce could have been asking for me? Why in the world should Matt have written me a letter? It's postmarked the 10th. He must have written it the day before I... Well, I might as well read it. Dear John, you'll get this letter when you reach New York. By then, you will be William Quincy for good and all, and Quincy will be John Harrington. I've talked with him, and he has agreed as his first act to ask your lawyer for the evidence you've been holding over my head all these years. He will destroy it. Then, at last, I will be free of you forever. <laughs> that poor devil, that was his mistake. Now, what else did he say? And now, I want to give you a word of warning. The worm has turned after all these years. I have outsmarted you at last with your own help. What in thunder does he mean? Why do you suppose Quincy was so willing to take your face and go to jail even for money? He had good reason for it. Believe me, he... Who is it? Telegraph, Mr. Quincy, sir. Telegraph? Just a second. Well, let's have it. All right, Quincy, put him up. Come on in, Rocky. Yeah, Lefty. Well, Quincy, old pal, you don't seem very glad to see us. Well, what's the meaning of this? Who are you and what do you want? That ain't Quincy. My trigger thing is itchy. Back up a little. Uh, uh, That's better. Who are you? What do you want? Why, we want you, Quincy. You ought to know that. I don't know who you are or why you're here, but you're making a mistake. Listen to him, Rocky. He's forgotten his old pals Lefty and Rocky. <laughs> I tell you, I never saw you before in my life. You mean you've forgotten all about it, Detroit, Quincy? How you double-crossed the boss and my kid brother six months ago and got them both bumped off by the cops? Well, ain't that forgetful of you? No, you're wrong. You've got the wrong William Quincy. Hey, Lefty, you, you don't suppose this could be the wrong guy, do you? Ah, what makes you say that? You're nuts? No, no, but, well, it's just that this guy's voice don't sound like the way I remember Quincy's voice did. That's right. I'm not the Quincy you know. Never mind the voice, Rocky. Look at the face. Yeah. Could there be two guys in a world with a puss like that? But I tell you, I'm just trying to stall. Let him have it. No, please. I'll give you a million dollars. <laughs> Well, that takes care of that. Yeah, that pays off for the boss and your kid brother. Ah, uh, he should have known we'd keep looking for him till we found him. Did you hear that stuff about a million bucks? You must have been nuts to think we'd listen to guff like that from a cheap dope peddler like Bill Quincy. Yeah, but you know, Lefty, I'd still kind of like to know who sent us that letter. Tipping us off, we'd find him here at the Clark House in New York. And so ends the tale, The Man with the Stolen Face, as it is written in the sealed book. The plot, which John Harrington had so cleverly contrived to change his identity led him to his doom at the hands of William Quincy's enemies. Twisted indeed are the strands of fate in which destiny entangles mere mortals.
And now, keeper of the book, before you close the great volume, show us the tale we tell next time. This one. Ah, yes. The tale of a handsome and mysterious man who had a strange power over people and who caused heartbreak and ruin wherever he went. A tale titled, My Beloved Must Die. Be sure to be with us again next time when the sound of the great gong heralds another strange and exciting tale from The Seal Book. The Seal Book, written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan, is produced and directed by Jock McGregor. Sunrise and sunset, promise and fulfillment, birth and death. The whole drama of life is written in the sands of time. We present a new series of radio programs, The Clock. Good evening. I'm glad to see you set your clock again for me. I brought you another story. It was told to me by a friend of mine, a watchmaker by train. We were uh, tinkering around together, so to speak, when he decided to pass the time of day with a little yarn. <laughs> Passing the time of day is something you can always get me to do, and if I may say so, I do it rather well. You see, I'm one chap who has lots of time on his hands. Well, according to my friend, the story involves a fellow named Littlefield, a man of some intelligence and ingenuity. He was employed by a broker named Roberts as a personal secretary. Their relationship was extremely cordial. Oh, what time is it, Littlefield? It's uh, 10.20, Mr. Roberts. Sorry to have uh, you work so late like this. That's quite all right, sir. I don't mind at all. Well, I guess we're just about cleaned up. Yes, I think so. Mm -hmm. I'll get it. Uh, Mr. Roberts' office. John? Uh, yes, uh, it's, it's for me, Mr. Roberts. We all. John. What is it, Louise? What's the big idea? Uh, beg your pardon? Don't beg my pardon. What's the big idea? It's almost 10.30. Why aren't you at home? Well, well I, I worked late tonight in the office. Well, why didn't you call me? I'm afraid I forgot. You didn't forget. You did that on purpose. You knew I'd worry. Louise, I'm still working. I sleep over a sap half the day, and you don't even show up for dinner. What do you think I am, a cow? You can't treat me like that and get away Look, with we'll it. We'll discuss it later. We'll discuss it now. I'm sick and tired. I'm very sorry, Mr. Roberts. Your wife. Yes, it, it wasn't important. Mm, uh, how long have you worked for me, John? Fifteen years, sir. Mm, that's a long time. Yes. Somehow it's brought us very close. You know, I feel I can trust you more than anyone else in the world. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. And so I also feel I have the privilege of talking to you like a father. You're in trouble. No, no. I mean, with your wife. No, not exactly, sir. She's called the office every day now for a week. And, my boy, I know it's upset you. Now, look, I assure you, Mr. Roberts... Come, it's... now, we can be frank with each other. I'm a man who understands. I, I, I don't know what you, you believe that I'm in, in trouble, sir. I tell I'm... you why. You see, I've met your wife. But uh, I've never met that young blonde woman I saw you dining with the other evening. Uh, oh, now, don't look so unhappy. I, I don't hold it against you. Well, that's very kind of you, Mr. Roberts. A mild flirtation never hurt a man. However, those things can go too far. And I'd hate to see a friend of mine and a trusted employee break up his marriage because of a silly and unimportant episode. Yes, you're quite right, sir. Having never been married myself with no family of my own, perhaps I feel there's something I've missed. I understand. Oh, do you really? Yes. Good. I trust you'll think it over for your own sake. Very, very carefully. Yes, I will, Mr. Roberts. <laughs> well, 
Oh, so much for the fatherly pep talks. Now, if you'll just put this envelope into the office safe, you can go home to your wife. With my apologies for keeping you. Very well, sir. I put it in the safe, little Field. You know that envelope contains $1,500 in cash? The Dawson account. I'm depositing it to his name in the morning. Oh, my boy, what's the matter? Sir, sir? You keep staring at the safe dial. Now, don't tell me you've forgotten the combination after all these years. <laughs> no, 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 sir. <laughs> I was just thinking of something. Uh, your wife? Yes, sir, uh, my wife. Ah, then you've made up your mind. I think so, Mr. Roberts. Good. Yes, yes, I've uh, definitely made up my mind. Hello, Gloria. Hi, Sugar. I'm sorry, Gloria. I'm waiting on? About half an hour. I ordered a sandwich. You want one? Oh, no, no, thanks. I'm not having any dessert. i got to watch my seat here. I'm liable to lose my man if I lose my figures. You'll never lose me, beautiful. Here we go again. Same old monarchy. What, 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 what do you mean? Go on. Tell me how nuts you are about me. Give me that bunk about not being able to live without me. Bunk? Sure. Because right after you say it, you go back to your wife. But Gloria, honey, I... I've been doing a lot of thinking, John. There don't seem to be much future in it. Future in what? You. You don't mean How long do we go on this way until I'm old and you kick off and leave her your insurance? Is that all you're thinking about? Insurance? Oh, for love of Harry, look at it my way for a change. She's got the security. I got the romance. But in the end, she gets the last laugh. Yes, maybe you're right, Gloria. You do have a right to think of yourself. Well, what are you going to do about it? You know, Louise won't give me a divorce. So what am I supposed to do? Take the rap? No, no, no. Not taking any reps. Gloria, I, I've made up my mind. We're going away. On what? I'll have money. Your wife banks every nickel you earn in her name. You don't earn much anyway. Well, I, I have another source. Oh, yeah? Yes, I can get hold of $1,500, Gloria. It's, it's, it's a good start. Oh, it's a good start. It's even a swell thing. Yeah, well, we'll leave, we'll leave town. We'll never come back. Just, just you and I. What about your job? I'm sick of my job, and I'm sick of that old fool, Roberts. <laughs> I don't blame you. Skin's been only raised once in the last five years. Isn't that what you're doing? Yeah, that's quite right. You know, he should have been a lecturer, not a bro. He's always given me good advice. I can find myself another stooge. I'm finished. When will we leave, Sugar? Tonight. Tonight? When will you get the doll? Tonight. They say the right man can take 40 years to acquire a superior intelligence. And the wrong woman could make a fool of him in 40 minutes. John Littlefield was no exception to this rule. He had the key to the office, and he had the combination of the safe. The rest was easy. Or so he thought. Four, verse 12, back to one. Can do it. Ah, oh, my nose. Fifteen hundred and fifty dollar bills. What? John! What are you doing here? I, I, I just returned it. You, you opened the safe. That money you wanted to steal it. Get out of my way, Mr. Roberts. Oh, John, you fool! Did you really think you could get away with this? Don't you know how obvious it would have been? Why'd you have to come back? I'd forgotten something. Sorry, now I did. I would have preferred you to, to get away with this, John, than to get you red-handed. Get out of the way. Put that phone down. John! Put it down. You... Come on, let go of me. Come on, let go, you idiot. Let go. All right, now get up and keep quiet. I don't want to hit you, but I will if you open your mouth. Go on. Go on, get up, I say. Mr. Roberts, get Mr. Roberts. What's the matter with you? Wait. Mr. Roberts, wake up. Mr. He's dead. Who are you? Hello, Luther. Don't you remember me? Well, what do you know? John Littlefield. The boy most likely to succeed. Come in. If you are the last man in the world I have expected to see, John Littlefield. Yes, it's been quite a few years. I'll say it has. Say, how, how did you know where I lived? Well, I, I saw your address in the... 
Yeah, in the papers when your case came out in the court. Oh, that. <laughs> yeah, it took away my license to practice, but who cares? I still know more about surgery than the whole stupid lot of them put together. Well, apparently they believe that drunkenness isn't uh, not exactly becoming to a surgeon. Particularly when he has a scalpel in his hand. I never like medicine anyway. The hours are rotten. How about a drink? No. I don't have one. No. What? I need you cold sober, Bixby. You need me? How have you been doing since you lost your license? Are you by? Yeah, yeah, but not too well, I can see that. Bixby, you used to have a small uh, private hospital in this place, didn't you? What about it? Uh, do, well, do you still have enough uh, equipment to, uh, to perform an operation? You forget. I'm not a doctor anymore. But do you have the equipment, Luther? Just tell me. Oh, yes, yeah, it's all here. I'm getting rid of some of this. You, you need money, eh? None of your business. Yeah, but, uh, how would you like to make $1,500, $1, Luther? What? $1,500 in cash. Cold cash. I have it with me. What do I have to do? Let's just, just perform a little operation on me. But I... I told you, I'm not allowed to practice. That's why I'm here. I don't want anybody to know about this operation, but, but you. Sit down. Thanks. Now, what kind of an operation do you want me to perform? You are quite well known for your technique in plastic surgery. Mm, what about it? I think you could change my face. You know, everything about me so that... So that even my own wife wouldn't recognize me. You crazy little fish. Just answer my question, yes or no. Uh, I haven't got any time to argue. Uh, could be married. Yeah, could. Well, can, can you graft skin out of my fingertips? You're full of fingerprint experts? Maybe. Uh, I could do that. You, you're quite sure, Bixby. You, you're quite sure you can change me completely. Well, it would require a lot of work, uh... I could cut the facial nerves and change the muscular appearance of your cheeks. Uh, if I extracted all your teeth and put in a couple of bridges, your mouth would be different. Yeah, well, what else? I could change the shape of your nose, give you a scar across scar one eyebrow. Across. Very good. Yeah. I would even change the expression of your eyes. Uh, your hair could be dyed gray. I might give you a permanent bald spot on your head. Yeah, good, good. That, that sounds perfect. Yeah. I could change you a little fear so you wouldn't even recognize yourself. And would you do all this without asking any questions? For $1,500? Yeah, $1,500. You'd be taking a chance. I have to work without a nurse. I don't care. I'm used to taking chances. You must be very anxious to avoid the police. I said without asking any questions, Bixby. Tell me, is it a, is it a deal or isn't it? We'll operate. Tonight. Time, like everything else, is relative, according to our thoughts and surroundings. To a man who is happy in his work, it has wings. To a fugitive from justice, it barely moves. And three weeks of convalescence have made John Littlefield a very impatient man. How do you feel, John? I'd love to have him. When are you going to take these bandages off my face? Well, let's see if we're ready. I think we are. Yeah? Yes, yes, it looks like this. Well, is let's it. get him off. Oh, no, wait, wait, wait. Let me do it. Hurry up, I would say. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You're going to get quite a surprise, little Phil. Am I? Well, you see yourself in the mirror. Have you, have you done a good job? I've never done better. I've earned my money, too. Yeah, all right. Cooped up in this house with you for three weeks without a drink has been quite a trial. Look, you can drink yourself to death after I leave. <laughs> yes, no doubt I will. Uh, here we are. Well, let's have a look at you. Well? Look in this mirror over here. Hey, hey, Bixby. How do you like it? Why, well, man, you, you were right. You know, it, it, it's, it's even hard for me to recognize myself. There are only two people in this world who will ever know who you are. <laughs> the patient and his eminent surgeon. Now, um, I'd like to get paid. Hi, I'm, I'm going to pay you, Bixby, but uh, it, what, what, suppose we have a little drink first? Oh, Dr. Bixby has never been known to refuse. <laughs> okay, let me pour it in, huh? Oh, where did you find that bottle? In your closet. I made certain to hide it from you until the government. 
Uh, quite a character, Littlefield. Yeah. Here we are. Drink up and have it straight. Well, here's to a great future. For both of us. Yeah, especially for you. Well, uh, at least we what are your plans. Do you intend to blackmail me? Oh, no, 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 not really. That won't be necessary. You see, I uh, expect you to uh, voluntarily make a small donation every now and then, and, you know, for all Lang Syres. Yes, yeah. Well, I hate to disappoint you. Oh, don't let that bother you. What? <laughs> What's the matter with me? Having a little trouble, Bixby? I... My eyes! Uh, I... Yes, uh, you had a little vial like uh, poison on your shelf over there. Uh, you know, I, I picked it up a few days ago for just this contingency. <laughs> it was in your drink, Bixby. <laughs> no, you, you never get away with this. Oh, don't be ridiculous, man. Mm. When the body of Dr. Bixby, the eminent mm. surgeon, has found the case of this to the suicide. Uh, no. It'll be obvious that you killed yourself because of shame. <laughs> <laughs> well, well. Uh, you said there are only two people in this world who'd ever know who I am, Bixby. <laughs> you know something? Now there's only one. Yes, John Littlefield had it all worked out. His timing, so to speak, was perfect. A few minutes later, he dropped his hat and his coat in the river. The coat contained an identification. His own. And from that instant onward, one John Littlefield ceased to exist. And then to make certain he'd be safe for the rest of his life, he made a bold and daring move. Something I can do for you, mister? Uh, yeah, well, yes, yes, you can. They told me downstairs that I'd find the uh, chief of detectives here. Yeah, that's me. Oh, good, well. Uh, I was standing near the waterfront a little while ago, and uh, I, I saw a man jump in. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'd have gone in after myself to save him, but I, I can't swim, you see. And, uh, there was nobody else around. Did he go under? Oh, yes, yes, he did. Yeah, but there was a top coat he'd taken off just before he jumped. I, I brought it along. With, this is it here. And there's a name inside on the pocket. Let me have a look. There you are. John Littlefield. Yeah, I can describe him for you. He was, he was tall. He, I'd say about my height. He had dark hair and, and regular-looking features. And we've been looking for that guy for weeks. You have? Yeah. His boss died less than a month ago. Oh, fancy that. A rich old guy named Robert. Heart attack. Then Littlefield disappeared. Did you, did you say heart attack? Yep. Found him in his office in the middle of the night. Too much work. The old gent didn't know when to take it easy. Yeah, but uh, look, why, why have you been looking for, for Littlefield? Well, the old guy didn't have any family. He left Littlefield all his dough. Oh, amounted to almost uh, half a million bucks. Oh. Yeah. Then the lucky dope takes a powder with some dame. His wife told us. You, you... Hey, what's the matter with you? Uh, uh, nothing, man. Not... Yeah, I guess it got you when you saw him jump. Okay, sit down and take it easy for a while. Go on. Yeah. I'll send out a squad to start grappling for the body. Wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hmm? Uh, <laughs> well, you're, you're not going to like this, but... Uh, well, I... I got to admit it was only a joke. What? I, I d didn't see anybody jump at all. I, <laughs> I'm John Littlefield. You don't say. I was Mr. Robert's secretary. It, it's true, I ran away because I was sick of my wife, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm back now. You, I, I'm back. What do you take me for, mister? A cluck? Oh, no, look, no, look, you've got to believe me, I... I only I, I gave you that story about seeing somebody jump in the river because of because you what? Well, I, I, I look, I, I, I got a fix of Littlefield right here in this drawer. Yeah, yeah, we got it from his wife. Now just take a look, Sonny. Take a good look. Yeah, well, if you and this picture got anything in common, I'll eat it. Envelope and all. But but, but look, yeah, uh, sir, you, you don't understand. I understand sir. enough to slap you in jail for fraud. I got half a mind to do it. You must be crazy to think you get away with something like this. Now, get out of here, you cheap chiseler, before I really get sorry. All right, all right, on. all right. All right. Look, you don't believe me, but I'll prove who I am. I, I, I'm, I'm going to prove it if it's the last thing I do. Gloria. Who, who are you? I'm John Gloria, John Littlefield. You're crazy. Look at me, Gloria. Look, look very closely. Don't... Don't you see? Can't you recognize me? I've never seen you before in my life. Get out! But, but you don't understand. Look, I've, I've, yeah, I know. I've changed my face. I, I, I look different, but I'm, I'm still John Littlefield. Gloria, you've got to believe me. My boy, listen to my voice. Can't you, can't you... Get out before I call the cops, you lunatic. Get out! Hey. 
Time has a way of meeting out justice, hasn't it? Listen as the clock ticks on for John Littlefield. Louise. What, what are you doing in my apartment? I'm your husband, Louise. I'm John Littlefield. Keep away from me. Surely you can identify me. Listen, you're my own wife. I, I know. I, I changed my face, but it, it, it doesn't, doesn't change my identity. Louise, you've got to see that, don't I you? I never saw you before in my life. You're not my husband. My husband is dead. No, he's not dead. They only think I'm dead. How did I get the key to the, the apartment? You know what? I had it with me all the time. It's my key, that's why. And, and I'm your husband. Look, L Louise, for heaven's sake, you've got to believe me. You're crazy. Look, Louise, listen, listen, listen to me very carefully. Now, if, if I can identify myself, <laughs> we'll have half a million dollars. Robert's left it to me, Louise. To me, half a million. It's enough to live like kings for the rest of our lives. Oh, I see. Yes. Yes, yes I recognize you now. Of course, John. I know you. No, no. Look, you're only saying that because you're afraid. You, you, you don't really believe me just, at all. Look, just let me go. Don't near the phone. Oh, Please, mister. I never didn't think of you. Leave me alone. I haven't got any money. Take whatever you want and leave me alone. Please. Oh. Should have known. Bixby did a good job, all right. If I, if I can't convince you, I... <laughs> who can I convince? Look, uh, hello, look, you remember me, Did Detective Henderson? Do you remember me? I sure. You're the guy who said he was little. Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. Well, I also said I could prove it to you, and I can. I can identify myself. Oh, now that's very interesting. Y yes, I can. Yeah. Well, matter of fact, we've been looking for you, Mister. You have. Hmm. Tell me about this uh, identification you've got. Yeah, well, it, it, in the excitement, you see, I, I forgot I even had it. But, mm. <laughs> but funny thing, it was on my finger all the time. What was? The, the ring, this onyx ring. You see it? it well, I was a fool not to think about it before. Let me see that. There's an inscription in a, in a band. Yeah. See, it, it, John Littlefield from Ralph Roberts. Mm -hmm. he, Mr. Roberts gave it to me years ago. He's very fond of me. That's why he left me his money. I was very faithful to him. He, he liked me like a son. He he, he wanted to pay me. Now, Look, look at the ring, see? Yeah, 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 I'm looking. Well, doesn't it convince you? Sure. Of a lot of things. Come on. What do you mean, come on? Where are we going? To the city morgue. There's something I'm going to show you. Over here, mister. And pick up that sheet. No, I go don't. On, go on, go on, pick it up. He's been dead for three weeks. The car in a figure he was slugged and pushed into the river just about the time you told me you saw him fall in. Oh, oh no. It isn't easy to recognize his face, is it? Oh, the That's what water does to a buddy after a while. We found him in that shirt and those shorts he's wearing. But we also found his coat and hat in another part of the river. With identification cards. You mean? There's Littlefield, mister. <laughs> you took his ring and his wallet. No, and took it cashing on his inheritance, too. <laughs> Why, of all the crusty schemes I ever heard of, this one takes a but cake. How can you be sure it's little fool? Why do you identify a corpse you never saw before and then call me a liar? His Why wife you... identified him, mister. His wife? Sure. You couldn't. And if you think she's going to change her mind, you're deafier than I figured. <laughs> now, when she comes into that half a million dollars Littlefield got from his boss... Impossible. No, I don't believe it. You're trying to fool me. You'll believe it, mister. No, no, when you get the chair for the money of John Littlefield. Everybody's trying to get the money. I won't let them have it. I want the money. I'm going to keep it. It's mine. It's And that's the story of Mr. Littlefield as recorded by the clock. Rather ironic, isn't it? Imagine being convicted for the murder of yourself. But then, justice has its own peculiar way of balancing the scales, and always in good time, those scales meet out their just and logical punishment. Well, I see my time is nearly up, and I must hurry off. I'll be seeing you again even sooner than you think. On a mantelpiece, perhaps, or I may look down on your Sunday morning from the steeple of the church. In any case, when we meet again, you can rest assured for one thing, I'll be right on time. The Clock will be heard again next week, same time, same station. Written by Lawrence Clee and starring Hart McGuire as The Clock. You heard Joe McCormick as John Littlefield.
Ken Wayne as Dr. Bixby, Frank Waters as Robert, Georgie Sterling as Gloria, Pat Martin as Louise, and Grant Taylor as Detective Henderson. The clock is directed by John Saul, a Grace Gibson radio production. Well, that's the show for tonight. I want to thank you all for listening. And remember, you can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash terror1970 or you can find me on Instagram at Radio Show Nerd or on Twitter at Radio Show Nerd 1. And if you want to drop me a line, say hello, make a suggestion, a request, a, even a critique, feel free to email me at radioshownerd at gmail.com. I also have a YouTube channel, Terror, Ch- Terror Radio. Please feel free to like the videos, share, subscribe. Will be highly appreciated. <laughs> Again, this is your host. Keith, a.k.a. The Radio Show Nerd, signing off. <laughs>